to the final point that uh, Professor King mentioned the uh, the ocean issue. Okay, this is also a cosmopolitan issue: it's the overfishing or the plastic of, uh, uh, plastic of pollution, yeah, which endangers the ocean biodiversity. Okay, this is also how we can contribute. Okay, now we have the, the next discussion. Yeah. Dr. Yang Ziyuan yeah, from the College of the uh, Innovative, uh, yeah, Innovative uh, College of the Zhengda University. Okay. And uh, firstly, I want to thank the Research Center for inviting me to have this meaningful engagement, to have the possibility to have this meaningful engagement in this dialogue. And I uh, also want to thanks to uh, Professor Klink for your very concrete uh, theoretical framework, although we know that it's still working in progress, right? So, uh, so I'm Qin Yuan Yang, Yang Zhiyuan. I'm an assistant professor from the very innovative college from Zhengzhi University. And uh, I have uh, received my PhD in sociology uh, from Lancaster University from the UK. I'm especially mentioning it, and that's because uh, Professor Clint also mentioned the John Uri, and the John Uri previously uh, have a position in our department. That's why I mentioned that. And uh, so I should start. Uh, my topic for today's short response. I would say the environmental uncertainty of offshore wind farms that responds to the uh, topic of the sea, uh, just also mentioned by uh, Professor Ed Klink, offshore wind farms in Taiwan. So I would rather use uncertainty rather than risk. I guess that's uh, due to the, re the same reasons uh, mentioned by Professor Klink. That's because uncertainty for me is a sort of a more refers to uh, the conditions that uh, uh, before uncertainty to be built into risk because we know risk is actually is include a very specific uh, well uh, a ways of understanding it its meaning and uh, a ways of uh, let's say knowledge scales of exploring risk okay so let's go back to the initial stage right uncertainty and uh, i also agree that uh, uncertainty is more like uh, a universal property okay right so uh offshore wind farms uh, some back uh, background information so after the fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011 taiwanese society and the government vows to reduce the use of nuclear energy and it's on this background, uh, the Bureau of Energy of the Ministry of Economic Affairs uh, launched the two mega projects, millions of photovoltaics and thousands of offshore wind farms. And uh, these two mega projects were launched back in uh, March uh, 2012. However, four and a half years later, uh, just before the change of power, the renewable energy only accounts for 2.3% in our national grid. And uh, uh, so that's the old story back in 2016. And uh, today, uh, in uh, 2023, so the figure is 8.95%. Uh, we can say we can see that there's a concrete growth of the uh, 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 renewable energy in our national grid. Although we can also admit that we uh, still have lots of things to do. And uh, for these kind of mega projects such as offshore wind farms in East Asian countries, is often supported by the state, like the. Uh, have been mentioned by uh, Professor Hermin Xiu and the Professor Zhou, uh, the developmental states as a legacy of the uh, East Asian countries. So the government has set a clear goal of achieving 20% uh, and later uh, this policy goals is to be down to 15% uh, uh, of uh, uh, renewable energy uh, used in our national grid before 2025. 
So that's with 20 uh, gigawatts of solar photovoltaics and 5.6 gigawatts of offshore wind farms. That's a lot, I need to say that, that's a lot. So, uh, and uh, before 2035, so the Taiwanese government even have a greater ambitious uh, target, that is to install the uh, 1.5 gigawatts uh, 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 before 2035, and then let's total 15 gigawatts. Anyway, that's really uh, out of in mind. The capacity won't well be uh, installed, it's really out of, our, out of our mind. And, uh, uh, and uh, another reason for the state to support, to lead, to initiate this kind of offshore wind farm project, of course, is for its environmental values. So uh, it's the reduction of carbon emissions to meet the INDCS. Okay, so I, yeah, I guess everyone, I, I guess everyone knows INDC, what is uh, INDCS, so I don't need to uh, explain it more. And uh, the most importantly, of course, it comes with economic values, the creation of a green color job, and it's also a state-led industrial development program, and focusing on the transfer of core technology of manufacturing, uh, for example, the wind turbine and the other components uh, locally, and uh, that's to uh, how how to do that is through the establishing the offshore wind parks. Okay, so uh, I think my uh, this short response uh, served as a complementary case, right, to the uh, the talk given by Professor uh, Clint, and uh, I borrowed this graph from uh, Hopperwood from two thousand and five, uh, and. I think uh, why, what this graph showed us is that uh, although we all support sustainability and the sustainable development, but actually this idea of sustainability is include a myriad of concepts, okay? And it's include, uh, like uh, uh, argued by Professor Click, it's uh, include many different uh, ontological assumptions and the differences. So I guess in a way, that's why uh, due to these ontological differences, although we all refer to the same umbrella term, which is sustainability, but actually we understand it. The understanding behind it is, can, be, can be such different, right? So I guess that's why uh, the road going to sustainability, it involves so many risks and the controversies. So I think on this stage we need to ask ourselves to what extent we should accept the current social technical program. For example, the case I just mentioned, the mass de deployment of offshore wind farms along the west coast of Taiwan. And also, equally important, how do we balance the views treating the program as a stress to or an opportunity for social economic well-being? And finally, uh, do we still trust each other among the least controversies? Right, I guess I don't have an answer for these questions, but I think these questions can really guide us through uh, the later, uh, the later talk. Okay, so again, I want to borrow. Yeah, again, thanks for <laughs> Professor Clint. Do send us the three papers I remember before your talk, so I can read it. Thank you for that. So the three dimension de deliberations. Uh, so the first one is epistemic deliberation, and the back to the context of case in Taiwan. That's all. That's uh, the wind found the siting process. And in the, this process, the both the physical and the social characterization are done. And also it includes the environmental impact assessment, the EIAS, and the, the relevant ecological surveys in order to get the data to be discussed in the EIA. 
So let's say uh, in uh, this on this dimension, actually we can see the uh, mobilization, uh, if you like, uh, of the uh, so many different kinds of expertise, including marine biology, ornithology, os that's the study on birds, and also the cetacean conservation biology, right? And uh, for the Associational deliberation. Uh, if my reading is right, and uh, this is open for uh, criticism, uh, I think that that is aimed for the very direct stakeholders. And I would like to say this kind of uh, this sort of uh, deliberation in Taiwan is still patchy. I mean, Taiwan is a developed and a democratic country. We do have this democratic uh, participation mechanism, but uh, the thing is, is a little bit patchy. So this can include uh, the negotiation of fishing compensation, but with uh, a very uh, deep assumption that uh, there is only economic concerns here in terms of fishing and uh, the loss of fishing lending can be compensated through money, right? But it also includes the more broadly, let's say, the transformation of the local economy and uh, the uh, thinking of the exploration of a fishery coexistence co with offshore wind farms. And the third is the technological deliberation. And if my understanding is correct, is toward the general public. And I guess on this dimension, it's even more patchy in Taiwan. And uh, because the general public is often not consulted on these controversies. But I need to say, there are indeed the national meeting for the energy issues, but the thing is that uh, for energy issues, of uh, exactly the energy issues on the sea, because of echo to the, today's topic. The, it's that uh, uh, the issues on the uh, national level, on regional level, on local level, is probably, is internally contradicted, that's the thing. So my, also, so my question is also goes to uh, Professor Clint is like, how can we assume like the general public and the general well? Because there are so many, uh, there are at least the three different layers of public, right? Okay, so let's go into today's uh, the main actors of today's case, the Taiwanese white dolphin. So the Taiwanese white dolphin is considered as a flagship species, Mingxin Wuzhong, on the context of the previous environmental movement, which has also been mentioned, which is the build of the, the opposition to the building of the uh, petrochemical uh, refinery along the uh, west coast called the National Glory Petrochemical Refinery, yeah. And anyway, it's on this very local or environmental movement context. The, uh, the NGOs, here I uh, specifically want to point out is S, it's plural, right? It's plural. And they are the emergent stakeholders. General trade, treat them, the Taiwanese white open, as an obvious target in ecological politics. So that means uh, they make natural uh, relevant uh, claims. For example, the, uh, these species can go extinction uh, because of offshore wind farms, right? Uh, later we will also uh, mention that uh, again. And uh, through the autopsy, unfortunately, from the uh, dolphin rescued or the body collected, the 80% of dolphins, they bear the human caused the scars. Uh, for example, from abandoned uh, fish nets, from uh, bycatch, uh, from the uh, propeller heating, uh, okay? 
So the heated debate revolving on land cost the whole regulatory arrangement built on the characteristics on Taiwanese white dolphin because they are the target of ecological surveys in the IA and the uh, habitats, the boundary of their habitats is specifically to be mentioned in the EIAs to, uh, for setting the boundary of offshore wind farms. And also uh, another regulatory standard is the threshold of underwater piling noise. It's also specifically set up based on the uh, physiological fragility. Okay? Until until the, the NGOs admitted that they get it wrong, or does it? I would say, probably, I say it get it wrong is too heavy. Is, uh, uh, but uh, that definitely you can see layers of that kind of change of strategy, okay? So, uh, the, so here is the graphic image alerts, uh, because later I will show you the uh, dead body of a white dolphin. Yeah, so I will go through it quickly. I, uh, uh, because I mentioned the piling, right? So I think uh, I need to spend uh, a little bit of time to, uh, to, say, uh, to introduce you there are different ways of uh, building offshore wind farms above the sea, which is uh, monopile or jacket or tripod. But anyway, the later development is to use floating uh, structures. So, which means Leo is Leo is no tether uh, put into the seabed. Leo are only moorings, the ropes, the moorings, okay, onto the seabed, right? And uh, from this picture, we can see that uh, Leo are, like I said, eighty percent of body collected uh, bear human caused scars. And uh, as you can see, some of the scars is coming from the ghost nets, okay, the ghost, uh, the abandoned fishing nets, right? Right. So the story continue on. Now the Fendi's uh, proposes is the new target of the movement. Now uh, means uh, last year. The NGOs starts to ask the Fendi's. Uh, uh, proposes to be specifically added to the survey list and argues that the previous EIA missed out the point by not giving them enough attention. But uh, checking, trace back to the first general EIA of offshore, offshore wind farms, there were indeed experts arguing the Fenley's purpose uh, could be more sensitive to underwater piling noise than Taiwanese white dolphin because they are more susceptible to the specific sound frequencies produced by underwater construction of piling. Okay, so that's a, actually a very scientific reason. Right, but the thing I want to say is that this kind of concerns has been aired, but in a way we don't know why it's washed down the in the later uh, development and the implementations of EIS until last year. Okay, so I would say it's a ecological politics. I would say that, and uh, also, uh, and that the ecological politics is part of the, the discursive democracy mentioned by Professor Klink today. So uh, as we can see. The conservation efforts, uh, most of the land has been put on to Taiwan's white dolphins. And, uh, uh, and as you can see, there are actually multiple reasons why the population of the white dolphin is declining. Decline. And it includes uh, the destroyed of habits, the pollute uh, air in the water, the ghost, the ghost nesting, and uh, the underwater noise, and also uh, the decrease of the volume of river water into the sea, which means the decrease of the food for the white dolphin. Okay? But you can see that uh, 
the most of the effort, like I said, and uh, uh, even include the resources put to the uh, ecological survey is, uh, I would not say solely focused on biodolphin, but most of them focused on biodolphin. Right, so this is uh, ecological social uncertainty. So, uh, my question to the uh, Professor Klink, well, uh, 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 I think this graph can uh, uh, remind many of us that uh, there is a topic about uh, science and uh, policy interface, right? And uh, I sort of borrowed this kind of uh, image and, uh, to uh, build up my own question to Professor Klink. So, if an epistemic site uh, or communities, its normative function is to provide uh, not a rock back like a fact, but the facts of at least the, uh, the truth relevant uh, claims that they are stable enough for building up a uh, uh, facticity. Then my question is, who should be the facilitator of the building of the expert network or assemblage, if you like? Because given that uh, these questions we are facing today are often so-called uh, wicked problems, and uh, which means they are truly transdisciplinary or with lots of uncertainties, and uh, which means we can just cannot assume there is a prior uh, expert network uh, or knowledge infrastructure has been built before. No, we cannot uh, assume that. And the second is the association known uh, deliberations of authority, then according to the definition is to foster the interplay between scientific expert, uh, expertise and the societal stakeholder experiences. Then my question is that uh, uh, in my case, in the local case, the EIA probably are very technical and aiming for utilizing uh, the data at hand to devise fair and practical standards for regulatory purpose. So this may not be appropriate arena for associational uh, deliberation. So, uh, but could you please share the case of how experts and the stakeholders interact with each other well, minimally? I think uh, uh, Professor Klinger has mentioned uh, a case of the governance of a great lake between Canada and the U.S., right? So, uh, if it's possible, we could hear more details of that uh, models of governance. And then the last one is the public uh, teleological side of democracy. It's the general well of the citizens and the mini public must receive the cognitive and the evaluative references, framework, and the mini structures. So for this, uh, I guess, uh, like I have mentioned, the first thing is that, uh, well, how can you, well, uh, in a way, assume that, that uh, the general well of the citizen can be reached even that. Uh, uh, in terms of, for example, in terms of energy issues. The study has, uh, showed, uh, has shown us that uh, there are always different concerns on different levels, national, regional, and local. They are always different. So my question is, the public's, they are plural, right? They are, they are not homogeneous. The public's, they are plural, are emergent and internally divided, in a way, with their own strategy and interests. How can we assume that there's a general well? Or at least, I know, I, I know uh, Professor Klink uh, uh, mentioned this theoretical framework for many purposes. It can be explanatory, it can be normative, and in a way it can also be descriptive. But I want, uh, if I may, I want to note 
quite in terms of methodology, uh, this can be this well can be legitimately uh, represented. Okay. So that's toward the end, and I don't know if we can hear the sound now. Give it a try. Yes, we can hear that. to uh, Dr. Yang's uh, uh, discussion and then we will take time to open to the floor yeah, a little bit, okay. Thank you very much for, uh, for your comments. Uh, it was interesting to hear about your two cases, but well, it's almost impossible for me to comment on that because I don't know them and it would be a little bit uh, hyper if, if I would do that. And, um, um, in general, I, I have some knowledge what might be uh, uh, aligned to that, so um, and that's why I do not want to go into detail in this case, it's just not possible, so I would more concentrate on your questions at the end. Maybe just a little bit of clarification of how you use the terms and which kind of adjectives uh, you gave uncertainty in a way, yeah, which is understandable, which everyone or many do in that way, which is of course uh, acceptable and is reasonable in different ways. Mm, for example, when we think about w w uh, offshore wind parks, first, if you really want to have good comments on that, you have to talk with Ortwin Ren because he did studies that included that in the energy transition in Germany. So because Germany is now getting a lot of electricity from the wind parks in the North Sea, um, so, um, um, and down to the south. <clears throat> the problem is, and, and I agree with you, that there are, there are ontological differences between the source of the, of the problem or the risk and, uh, and the controversies, but both are, with, I would say, within the ontological domain. In my, in my book, I try to explain that a little bit, what kind of, what that means, how to address that as well. So this would be not be something um, which I would uh, conceptualize in a different way. I would see the ontological uncertainty, and then it has to be uh, tailored down, and it has to be adjusted to that, to the case, of course. <coughs> um, the other point I want to make a short comment is, you said um, in your cases, and in general for Taiwan, of course, epistemic deliberation is in place, and, and the associational and the te teleological is patchy or very patchy, as you said. Of course, um, I did not say that so much. I, it was more a, 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 um, a tacit assumption that I think we, in all of our democracies, we have a lot of these epistemic deliberations and epistemic authorities. It's organized in different ways. Sometimes it's a, even a chaos and too much, and, and it is not a, well coordinated, that would be my criticism. Um, and here we have to look to how to organize this more. And what I mean is with these focal points is even if we can criticize the IPCC because of different reasons, what is good is to see that this is a real focal point where this network of climate researchers can contribute. So they have different if I say layers, I, it's already I uh, 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 disqualify them. But there are have researchers which have which make a lot of studies and publish, but do not participate in the IPCC itself or be, be heard. But through their networks of conferences and exchange worldwide, their insights make the way into the IPCC in a way. And then they have the closer layers around the IPCC, which are uh, changing over time with different uh, variations of topics, with different kinds of emphasis over the years. 
So we all know that. But this is a very an even layered kind of research network around the IPCC. And I think we need similar things more in with regard to to a larger fields of risks that we have to tailor. I do not want to give now just an idea that would be short-sighted to do that so ad hoc. So I have to be really um, reflected well, and that should be done also not by a single person like me. So in the discourse, in the academic discourse, and maybe even in the public discourse. And then, of course, I did also, as I agree with you, the associational deliberation and te teleological is very patchy everywhere. So we have a lot of that in Germany, we have that in Canada, but I'm not so happy with that in that way. So just a short anecdote, a couple of years ago the, the provincial government asked us at a university if we would like to host um, and help to organize a public um, consultation, as they called it, for on climate change in the province. So we said, of course, we will do that. So they sent someone who is the expert the political expert in that field. I do not say it is a scientific expert. So it was this of these many public consultations with the general public where you get invited and then you can just join in and have discussion. It was a short presentation, you get background information in advance and then you can discuss. He had a series of semi-structured questions that he wanted to go through to hear our uh, uh, resonance and to, to, to hear our feedback, what, we, what we're thinking about that. The big problem is, and that's I asked him at the end, he did not like it that I asked that, is what happens? So when, what is when, um, uh, because it was clear it was not a, at an early stage, a lot of things had already decided, a lot of policies already started to be implemented, so it was in the middle, in the course of policy making. What happened if there is something which you don't like, which is not in favor of the existing policies? And then he was very quiet. So uh, in, to make it short, th this aggregation mechanism is very, very uh, critical and we have problems everywhere. Even if the Great Lakes I mentioned is one of the most developed one, one of the most sophisticated in the world, the, the aggregation problem is that what I criticize most, because it's only in the hand what is called the International Joint Commission. It's a commission of three commissioners from Canada, from government, and three from the, the US government. And then they decide what gets into the biannual reports. So they have a kind of small comitology around them. So comitology is the word that, that is, has been created for all these advisory committees around the European Union and is now also used in other contexts, so I used it here. They have several advisory bodies, scientific ones and other ones, which are more stakeholders, and they give them advice how to do. But the final decision, what is in the report, is not something which is, you can say, uh, there are clear mechanisms, what not or not. And often criticism or op uh, opposite opinions are not in this report. So I asked them in my, I did a series of interviews with them, all of them, from the commissioners down to the experts and the public, uh, representatives of the public itself. So they say this is not existing, we have to trust them that they really take it seriously. But if you ask them, they can never say what it means. Oh, we take it seriously, we consider it, we discuss it, but they say then if it's not in favor of that, what you want to do, what happens? Hmm, and it was more or less, he was quiet because it was clear. If it's too much criticism or you have to change the course of action for the, then they wouldn't do it. So that is one of my big criticisms with regard to that, and that you are right. That's why I'm so much arguing, especially as, uh, 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 responding to you, that it has to be institutionalized. We need a mandate, we need a kind of aggregation mechanisms how they are uh, uh, committed to uh, integrate it into the political decision making. Because at the end of the day, if you like it or not, this is my opinion, the political system has to become much more a facilitator only, not facilitating the discussion. This is another question I want to answer to you. But only that they are the executive of the public and not making public opinion by themselves what many of these representative systems in our democracies are doing. And that is, for me, has a specific risk itself in it. 
So that's, that's very tricky in all countries. We don't have a perfect, and there is no, I did research on that theoretically and looked at the many empirical analysis. There is no recipe at the moment. So we have here some, we have to be creative to find ways to how to aggregate and it might be, it has to be tailored from case to case. What would be the best approach, yeah. And of course, again, here I would engage the public itself to do it, yeah. To how to handle criticism and opinions and because we have a lot of controversies that is, cannot be ignored, we have to integrate them somehow, in some way, even if we have to find solution. And to say, okay, this is now a practic pragmatic solution, but we are aware of that. And then it ha has to go into an iterative process that we uh, uh, reconsider that after a year or two years, that would be the best. This is, for example, oh, I forgot her name, um, uh, uh, one of the advocates of deliberative democracy in, in, in the US. She is uh, emphasizing that all the time, that we need recursive and iterative processes that is not something that we have a solution right now, that might be only for a short term, and then we have to review it. And the review is another question, how to do that, yeah. So the, to facilitate that is really something, it should be more in our hands, because we are one of the uh, members of the people and in societies of which get most trust, and which are most reliable because this is our ethos. Even of course, we make mistakes. We have public opinion. Uh, we have personal opinions, etc. Et but that can be balanced. So all professional uh, research institutes, like Otwin Rens uh, Institute, the Research Institute for Sustainability, is typically someone who is a good addressee to do to facilitate that. When I worked uh, early in my early stage of career with Orban Ren, I did the same. I, so I was in all roles and functions. I facilitated that and have to be uh, not giving any of my personal opinion. I was as invited as expert to give the epistemic input and I was someone who helped to organize this, this how to, to uh, organize the system, how to engage stakeholders and public and experts together. This is a big question, I'm right. We, we can only do it and try to facilitate it again by independent people who have professional skills. You need professional skills. Especially when you talk, when experts talk to lay people and, and the other way around, because some, uh, I, I don't want to criticize my natural scientific colleagues, but they often have problems really to understand what the public is saying. I don't say that we as social scientists do a much better job, but it's at least our, one of our topics to understand the, 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 the public uh, at all. Um, the publicity is divided, yes. I think yesterday there was, and I'm happy that it has been mentioned, it is very important how a public deliberation is organized. So there are different methods that we can uh, more or less to a high degree guarantee and that all the cleavages and divisions in the society are represented in that uh, uh, small number of citizens that we invite. So it starts that we uh, contact many people, then you get the responses, for example, mostly it's only 10-15% nowadays that they respond. But here already when you contact people, it is structures by, by for example, gender, age, class, education, etc., etc., professions. So, for example, it's typical um, for uh, last week, it was uh, uh, um, announced in the media, this new citizen council for the German government and food policy, and how they did it, and they did really a several step process to get to the people in that way, and how they did, and this was very important, because at the end, Theoretically, we, we, we call that descriptive representation. Because if you would do it again with another one sample, we, it would be the same constellation and you would have the same kind of divisions, the same kind of consensus possibility or not with another group. And that is difficult to communicate even among scientists, but this is also a part of public understanding, what we have to explain at the beginning of such things. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Otherwise people think, oh, why did, did you select 
me and not my neighbor or something like that. I, I was confronted with such questions in, 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 in many publics, in uh, uh, citizen uh, panels and such things. So then you have to explain how you do that. Yeah? And that is very important. So for example, in Germany, the, the academics respond. 70% of the responses of the 15% of the total, so they ask 20,000 people. 10% answer, 2,000. 70% of these 2,000 were only academics. Of course, you cannot take the 70% of academics into the citizen council. At the end, you look at the, how they are uh, uh, differentiated and distributed in the society at all. We have uh, figures about that, and then you represent that. So at the end, it is only 15% of the citizen council is academics, and the rest is of the other groups to be really, to be uh, uh, as close as possible what is called in the literature the descriptive representation in contrast to the re representative representation, yeah. because you cannot fulfill that in any way in that form. And it's random selection at the end, yeah. Then you have the groups and you know from which groups you want and what, uh, uh, from uh, that gender is equal, that ages are represented according to the demography, and, and such things, so that, that is all then fulfilled. And if you would do it again, you come to similar constellation on composition of the group, and that means, as far as we know, because we did some experiments on that, that is to happen, they come to similar uh, 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 formulations of policy. We did it, for example, many years ago, 20 citizen panels parallel, every week, meeting one time over a period of six months, it was about in a regional, about uh, waste management and uh, waste uh, collection and recycling. So, and this, at the end, the differences of the, of the results out of the public, of the mini publics, was not so big. Yeah. Well, a lot is about the organization. So we need this. We have to gain back if we lost it this trustworthiness that people trust us that we have the competences and skills to do that. Yeah. 